freedom. So for me, while learning the ropes from the three co-founders, I have received tremendous guidance from them and have managed to turn a negative 33% portfolio to a positive 110%. More importantly, a risk management in place. So in fact, to me, uh, the year 2020 have been a great year as I've made tremendous progress in terms of my own personal development. And I'm not shy to say about this. So as a result of what I have experienced and benefited from Ultimate Investing, I decided to get more involved with uh, Ultimate Investing by applying to be a coach. So it is my fortune that I am now able to give back to the UI community, which has been relentlessly fueled by the passion from the three founders. So today, UI Day marks a momentous point in our ultimate investing journey. The three gentlemen that you see right in front of you are the heart, body and soul of ultimate investing. And I know many of you may be wondering, what is UI Day? Who is curious? If you are typing me in the chat group right now and help me to invite Boba out and share with us what is UI Day all about? Type in me and then Boba will magically appear. Okay, okay, Bowen, you are very wanted right now. Take it away. All right, all right. Hi, everyone. Okay, if you are able to see me and hear me, can you just type in 133? If you can see me and hear me loud and clear, do me a favor, type in 133. All right, fantastic. I see all of your response. Okay, we have almost 400 of you today. So welcome to the UI Day. Very, very happy to see all of you. Okay, and of course, to start off this, I just want to wish everybody Happy New Year. So I think Regina did ask, okay, how did UID actually got started? I think very important is we need to understand that 2020 is definitely not an easy year for everybody. There has been a lot of changes, okay, including for all the investors over here, as well as people who are actually affected by COVID, right? Uh, a lot of us in terms of our job, in terms of how we actually deal with our business, many things have changed. And that is where I would say that Ultimate Investing, okay, we actually started about one and a half years ago. Last year itself, we actually have to make a massive change as well. All right. And I believe that actually Telegram is something that actually got started because of the COVID itself. And we are very happy to see that the Telegram is very well received. We have seen many feedback. Okay, people love it. People love the resources that we are giving. So we believe that in 2021, this is something that we want to continue to give. We want to continue to add more people into our investment community. And that is why I would say that the best time to share with all of you some good news for our plan for 2021 is of course to start off the year great by having the UI day on the third day of 2021. So of course today we have many, many speakers as well. So uh, I hope you guys stay all the way, okay? Because we have massive value to share with you for today's UI day. With that, back to you, Regina. Okay, okay. Exciting. As I get to know more about the founders when I got started with Ultimate Investing, I learned how different they are and yet they came together and shared a common goal. So it was very curious to me how did the founders come together and give birth to the Ultimate Investing concept. Ivan, could we have you to share with us the UI story? I mean, did it like happen over a, a beer session? Ivan. Okay, so hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to UI Day. This is Ivan here. Really glad to see all of you. Yeah, and also our special guest is coming up soon. So really uh, exciting. Now, my name is Ivan. I'm the uh, UI uh, technical analysis specialist here. And also, of course, I do uh, uh, long-term investing. So thank you, Regina, for bringing me up and um, just want to share a little bit about the story of how you, uh, Ultimate Investing comes about, how we got together and then created this whole uh, thing. Yeah. So let me just share my slides very quickly. Okay. It didn't start over beer or didn't start over in the garage. It just started over WhatsApp. So <laughs> this is just a, a WhatsApp that was uh, in April 2019 last year. Yeah. So um, just a message to Paul, you know, Paul is a good friend of mine. We've been, we've been together. We know each other for many years. 
And usually as good friends, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to support each other and then we praise each other for the good job done. So you can see, yeah. And then as we were chatting then, uh, I mentioned something that I say, maybe we can come together because during that time, uh, Paul and me, we were not doing anything much. We, we used to train for uh, some schools for many years and then we, we took a break and then we're just doing nothing. And uh, then I was suggesting that maybe we can come together to do something and yeah, what Paul has mentioned is that actually our strength is really to create a strong community because we really share from our heart. This you can uh, ask our students, right? So it's, uh, it's very obvious. Now, it happened that all the stars aligned and uh, I told Paul, why not we do some private coaching? And so I created a, a, a so-called like a slides proposal. Uh, but you know that uh, actually me and Paul, we are not that young. So we, uh, we need someone who is more energetic, someone who is more handsome, yeah, better looking than us. So that's why we invited Paul Wen to join us. And Paul Wen was, uh, was one of our students as well. And he's full of energy, really dynamic guy. So when he came on together, we are just like Magnex, you know, when Magnex put together, it just stick on together. So everything just come together so smoothly and that's how we uh, created this ultimate investing and as time passed we i flew to singapore to do some discussion with them and then they came to melbourne to learn some of the strategies so uh, that's a picture that we were in melbourne and july 2019 we started the uh, our first uh, training so our first uh, ultimate investing training and then we also did our first uh, private coaching yeah, so the ball keeps rolling and until today, we have one whole big group of community and the power of community is so useful, so exciting and everyone gets to get some uh, stock tips here and there every now and then. Yeah, so generally, this is how Ultimate Investing comes about and I hope you guys get a good idea of uh, uh, how all these things just stick together. Yeah, so Regina, thank you. So this is what I have to share. Okay, thank you, Ivan. I see. So this is how UI got started. It is always inspiring to hear how a common vision binds people together. Not to mention that UI is started across a long distance relationship. You know, one in Australia and one in Singapore. So among the three founders, each of you brings with you many years of experience. I believe there must be some view about 2021. So for this, Paul, I would like to bring you up to share with us what you think 2021 may have in store for us. Okay, thank you, Regina. Happy New Year to all. And uh, hope, hopefully we have a very prosperous 2021 going ahead. Uh, let me go, just gonna share screen. Um, yeah, if you can see my, my screen, right? Can you just type in tech, T-E-C-H, T-E-C-H. If you can see my screen. Good, good, good. Okay, don't worry, I'm not going to do a full-fledged presentation because today the guest is not me. The guest is actually a very special guest we've invited, uh, Dr. David, that is going to come on board. But I'm just going to touch very briefly on what is my personal view. 2020 has been an extraordinary uh, year. Things have changed a lot because of COVID. Going to 2021, some of the hot sectors may not be as hot. But to me, I see that um, there are three areas which I think uh, will still be trending. So I call it the fintech the health tech, and the green tech. Okay, I got, don't have time to go into it, but um, in the community, I'll start sharing uh, more about these stocks and I research more about them. But all of this actually comes with, a, you need an enabler, okay? So all this tech need to be enabled. And I think the whole enabler that will do this will be 5G. So there are a couple of 5G stocks which I'm eyeing also, which I'll share. So uh, like I said, we don't have time to go into all this. But what we'll do is um, I'll share it with our community on January 28, 2021. So mark these dates for those who are in our community. Uh, it's our QMeet, which is our quarterly um, sharing. And I'll, I'll come up with a slide deck sharing about all these three trends and also the enabling technology 5G that will be doing this. Okay. But um, so I know all of you come not to listen to me talk, but actually to listen to Dr. David. So can I just doc invite Dr. David to... Um, to be on screen and uh, say something. Dr. David? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Hi, hi, David. Yeah, so um, uh, just a very brief um, introduction about, about David. Um, so, um, well, a um, very smart gentleman. I mean, I've got your long, long picture. I hope you like it. Um, he's the co-founder of Smart Investor. He was 
formerly also the CEO of Motley Fool Singapore, which has been very, very successful. So outside of this, he's also a renowned broadcaster, motivation speaker, and the doctorate come from uh, in chemistry. And um, investing journey covers um, starting with pharmaceuticals and gaming industry. Dr. David, do you still do the gaming industry as much? No, uh, yes and no. Yeah. Um, I guess in, uh, well, uh, when I have some spare time, I tend to go up to a uh, cranky race course and um, have a flutter on the horses. Uh, but uh, that, that is about as close as I get to the gaming industry at the moment. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, so yeah, thanks for that candid answer. And um, um, as a champion of long-term income investing, so um, David actually sees stocks market as false as a, ter a, a terrific opportunity. And um, he's more known to look at dividend paying stocks. Okay, but then um, over 20 years of experience at Motley Fool, he also believes in buying assets and prepared to pay him for, for owning them. So, um, of course, David's view has been regularly sought after and he's been a regular on the BBC, CNBC, CNA, 938 Live, Money FM, uh, what's what we have. So he also writes a monthly column for the Business Times under Diary of a Private Investor. But then, without much further ado, I'll invite Dr. David to share his crystal ball on what he sees in uh, 2021. Dr. David. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen so that... Sure. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so that all the participants can... Uh, hopefully be able to see what I have to offer. Right, so technology is not one of my strong points. Right. No problem. Yeah. Is, my, is my screen shared at the moment or not? Uh, no, not yet. Um, Still not yet. Yep. Okay, starting. Right, I okay, we, saw it, we saw it in a norm, okay, in presentation mode now, good. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I love this first slide because this one is, uh, if, you can, if you can see what it actually says there, 2021, and around that is hope. And I think really that is what 2021 is all about. It is all about hope, that uh, we hope that we will be able to put behind us this thing, 2020, the elephant's backside, and that we can actually start moving forward to something new. What we need to remember is that 2020 was dreadful. I mean, 2020 was all about uh, COVID-19. And if you have a look at this gentleman here, he reminds me of the Asian financial crisis. And really, COVID was worse than the Asian financial crisis. It was also worse than the dot-com bubble bursting. And I was around for both of those. And finally, it was worse than the Asian financial crisis of, uh, so sorry, the great financial crisis of 2008. And the reason why it's actually worse than the Asian financial crisis, the dot-com bubble bursting, and also the great uh, financial crisis of 2008 is simply because all of those episodes were financial crises, but this one is different. This one is about a financial crisis wrapped up in a health crisis. So you can't solve one without being able to solve the other. What the central banks actually did was they came along and they printed lots of money. That has helped, but it hasn't helped the COVID crisis. What the money has actually done is to make life a little bit better for everyone. Uh, governments have enacted fiscal policies. They've actually put money into people's pockets and the central banks have cut interest rates to virtually zero. And all of that has helped the financial side, but it hasn't really sort of helped the health side. The other thing about COVID-19 is that it has been called the virus of truth. And there are lots of truths around the world that people need to address now. And one of the biggest truths is that we ignored SARS. We ignored MERS. We ignored the avian flu. We ignored swine fever. We ignored mad cow disease. We ignored Ebola. We ignored Zika. We said, that'll all just go away. And every time one of these things happened, we solved the problem and then we pushed it to one side. But this time with COVID-19, it is a warning shot. It's telling us that something is wrong with the world. Something is wrong with the way we do things and we have to change. 
If we don't change, then we are going to get an even worse pandemic than the one we just experienced. For many people, we'll just be going back to normal very shortly. Uh, normality will mean different things to different people. But ultimately, what it really means is that some sense of normalcy will return to people's lives. Unfortunately, though, is this the kind of new normal that we want? Do we want to start going back to work the way that we were previously, piling into MRTs every morning and going back to the office? Is that the kind of normality that we want? The other thing is, is that the kind of normality that we want? Everybody knows to bumper on the highway going back to work again. Some people say, yes, uh, we want to go back to that because that is economic activity. But you have to ask yourself the question, what has COVID-19 actually taught us? And if you have a look at this, we had a problem with traffic back in the 1960s. And what did the governments do? Well, they say we have a traffic problem, so let's build more highways. Let's go and build more expressways. So we ended up with the PIE, the ECP, the, the AYE. All of these highways just started to appear from nowhere. Why? Because they said they had to bring everybody down to the south of Singapore, back to the CBD area, because that is where all the economic activity is. But here's a question I want to ask you. What was the name of Singapore's first expressway? I know all of you have uh, the ability to type in answers. So uh, just to test to make sure that number one, uh, you have a good memory of Singapore's history, better than mine. And secondly, that the, uh, the texting actually works. Can you tell me what is the name or what was the name of Singapore's first expressway? Most of the people type in PIE. I know. Most of the people, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for that, Paul. And of course, PIE is wrong. That is the wrong answer. Do you want to try again, Paul? Um, some people say Nico Highway. It is Nico Highway. Yeah, well done. <laughs> it, was a, it was a taxi driver who told me it was Nico Highway. And if you think about it, Nico Highway was built in the 1960s, right? So we had a traffic problem in the 1960s. And what do we do to try and solve the traffic problem? We just build more expressways, yeah? We just go and build more highways. Why did we think about something like this? Why did we think about working from home? Why did we get more people to work from home back in the 1960s instead of transporting them all the way to the south of Singapore? The answer is because we couldn't, and now we can. In those days, we didn't have the internet, so therefore everybody had to go to work. But now there is a new normal that people have experienced the ability to work from home. People like it. And we've also proved that we are not any less productive just because we work from home than from an office. And so things will change. And that really is the theme of 2021 and beyond. It is change. Things will have to change. But because things will change, it is also a chance for investors like you and I. We will be able to participate in that change and take advantage of what is going to be changing in order to hopefully make a bit more money. Now, what are these changes that I'm talking about? The first one is unemployment. That is going to be a big problem. If we have a look at what has happened as a result of COVID-19, is that unemployment spiked. And gradually, people are going back to work again. But unfortunately, not everybody will be able to go back to work because the jobs that were there previously are not going to be there in 2021 and beyond. So unemployment is going to be a huge problem, not just for Singapore, but certainly for everybody else in the world. It is going to be a massive problem. And what are governments going to do? Well, they're going to fall back on three things. The first one is patriotism. In other words, they're going to say, let's look after our own people, right? We're going to be more patriotic. Mm -hmm. The second one is nationalism. And that is very dangerous because they're going to start waving the flag and they're going to say that we are better than another country. And that is very dangerous. And the third one is protectionism. They're going to be protecting their own industries at the exclusion of other people. We are already seeing that. 
We are seeing that in the US when they are delisting American, uh, sorry, Chinese companies from the American stock market. We are beginning to see patriotism, nationalism, and protectionism happening. So that is one thing that we need to be very aware of. The second big change in 2021 will be the US dollar. Now, the thing about the US dollar is that it is falling. It is falling very, very quickly. And it is falling for four reasons. The first reason is the budget deficit. America will have to borrow more money in order to try and get its economy moving again. So the budget deficit is a huge problem for America. That is gonna cause the dollar to fall. The second one is safe haven. Because economies are opening up again, people are saying, I don't need to feel safe in order to put my money back into the US dollar. I can put my money somewhere else where it is uh, slightly riskier, but uh, I don't really mind that because maybe I might be able to make more money outside of the US dollar because I don't need to feel safe anymore. And the third one is the interest rate differential. We know that the US interest rates are gonna remain low for a very long time. So therefore, there is going to be an interest rate differential between the US dollar and what is available elsewhere. And people will say, well, the Chinese yuan is paying me more than the US dollar. I'll switch out from the US dollar into the Chinese yuan. And there is a fourth reason why the US dollar will fall. And this is one where we can take advantage of. And that is that America will have a trade deficit, despite everything that Donald Trump has tried to do over the last four years, it will have a massive trade deficit with the rest of the world. And the reason why it will have a trade deficit is because of this. Household spending in America is higher than any other part of the world. It is twice as high as the European Union. It is nearly three times more than China and eight times more than Japan. And the reason why is very simple. Americans like to buy cheap stuff from somewhere else. And they like to buy shoes made in Vietnam. They like to buy goods made in China. So they will continue to import. And it is because they are going out and buying those things that the Federal Reserve will have to keep on printing more money in order for Americans to go and buy those goods from outside. And that are the four, those are the four main reasons why the US dollar will continue to fall in 2021 and beyond. And the third thing we need to remember about 2021 and beyond is that interest rates will be virtually zero everywhere, apart from some countries that can raise interest rates. So those low interest rates are going to be good for the stock market. If you have a look at what has happened to US interest rates, it is almost impossible for the Fed to try and raise interest rates without causing another tantrum in the stock market. And so therefore, I think it will continue to remain low for a long time until such time that unemployment starts to improve in America. So US interest rates are gonna be low, and that therefore means that most other countries will follow the US interest rates and keep those low also. So the three main themes are low interest rates, the falling US dollar, and high unemployment. Those are the three themes in 2021 and beyond. Now, low interest rates is good. Interest rates are a gravity on stock prices. When interest rates go up, it pulls stock prices down. It's natural. But when interest rates are low, it means that the stock market will remain elevated for quite some time. And with all this money that is swirling around the global economy, I don't really have that much problem with the stock market in 2021. I think stock markets will remain buoyant in 2021 and beyond simply because of the lack of gravity. There is not going to be interest rates trying to pull down stock prices. The second one is the US dollar. Now, don't be afraid of the US dollar falling as a reason to not to invest in American stocks. You have to remember that a low US dollar is actually beneficial to American companies. American companies that operate overseas, when the US dollar is low, it simply means that when they convert their foreign currencies back into US dollars again, it will flatter the bottom line of many American corporations. So every time you go out and buy that 
cup of Starbucks coffee that you might like. Other coffees are available, but if you do like a Starbucks coffee, it means that Starbucks will be able to convert that Singapore dollar or that Malaysian ringgit or that Chinese yuan back into US dollars again, and it will look as though Starbucks is doing well. And by the way, Starbucks is doing very well, even without the benefit of uh, a low US dollar. But the US dollar will help flatter its bottom line simply because currencies work that way. And of course, the final thing is unemployment. This is what people refer to when they're talking about this K-shaped recovery, or when you hear politicians talk about an even recovery in 2021 and beyond. What they're actually saying is that there will be some people that will do exceedingly well, and there will be also some people that will not do well. They won't do well because they are unemployed. And so the governments will have to continue to help those people. But for those people, even though the economic numbers will tell us that the recession is over, the economies are growing, for them it will still feel like a recession because they're not able to partic participate in the economic growth that is going on. If you're out of work and your next door neighbor is going to work, well, for you, it feels like recession because you haven't got any money coming in. So in times of recession for these people, we should focus on the things that people can afford to buy or the things that people cannot do without. So consumer staples, I think, will continue to do well. These are the things that we need to buy all the time. So have a look at those companies that focus on consumer staples. Some of my favorite companies are Procter & Gamble, Unilever. Just because we're in a recession doesn't mean that we don't go and put our laundry on. It doesn't mean that we don't go and brush our teeth. So these are the consumer staples that uh, I think will do well in 2021 and beyond because they are things that people can easily afford to buy. The second one is REITs, my favorite. Because interest rates are going to be low, it means that if you want an income, you're going to have to start looking around for REITs. And don't be so concerned about those people who tell you that the days of REITs are over. It is not over. They are still one of the best ways of generating income. And about, I would say, between a quarter and a third of my portfolio is in real estate investment trusts, REITs, because they do have the ability to continue to pay you distribution. And the only time when REITs do not do well is when they can't borrow money, and that, and, and that is always a worry, when they can't refinance their loans. And so therefore, I'm not too concerned about REITs at the moment. Uh, I think there is still plenty of cash swilling around the place, and we are going to be getting economic growth. So if we have some kind of economic growth and we have the availability, availability of cash, then I think REITs will continue to do well. And the final one is banks. People are very afraid of banks at the moment. They say, oh, what about all those bad loans? What about all those um, doubtful debts that they have? Won't they have to write them off? Sure, they're going to have to write them off. But I think banks will do well in 2021 and beyond simply because we're going to be coming out of recession. Anyone who has ever run a business knows that as you go into recession, you start selling all your stock. You start using up whatever cash you have. But as we come out of recession, you're going to be needing the banks. You're going to be needing to go back to the banks in order to borrow money, in order to grow your business again. So the banks will be able to benefit. And the other question that people ask is, what about those low interest rates? Yes, it is absolutely true. The net interest margin will remain low, but don't forget that the net interest income is a result of the product of the interest rate and the amount of money borrowed. And the banks have plenty of money to lend out at the moment, and they will lend them to good companies, companies that have got good balance sheets, who want to grow their business. So I think banks will do well in 2021 and beyond. And there's another reason why banks, I think, will do well, and it is because they're going to be able to start rewarding shareholders again with dividends. The UK has already said that they're going to allow banks to start paying, and so I think, in that sense, the banks will start to perform well. So that really is it. And I want to leave you with one final photograph. It's not a reminder for you to go and brush your teeth at the moment, nope. What it is, is that when the central banks 
printed all that money. It was like you and I squeezing too much, too much toothpaste out of the tube. Now, I defy anyone to try and put that toothpaste back in the tube again. It is not going to happen. Nobody has worked out how to put the toothpaste back in the tube. And in the same way, no central bank has worked out how to take back the trillions of dollars that they have printed. And it is because of all that money that is swirling around the place looking for a home, people will be looking for various asset classes, whether it is cash, bonds, properties, or the stock market. And I think the stock market for me is probably the best place where I can have some control over how I want to determine uh, the ability for my money to grow in 2021 and beyond. And I just want to point out this little scroll behind me. I don't know if you can see it. It is my family tree, by the way. And it is a reminder for me that I am a custodian of the money for not only myself, but also my children and my children's children. So I want to grow money over the long term, and I'm talking about decades, I'm talking about centuries. And that is my responsibility as the oldest of my generation to look after the money for future generations. And with that, I thank you so much for listening and I hope you'll be able to go away in 2021 and beyond and have confidence in investing in the stock market. Okay. Can we have a round of applause for Dr. David for his insights? I'm sure you got all have you all have actually taken down notes because it's very, very valuable. So you talk about three things: consumers, um, um, uh, consumer products, um, banks, and REITs. So these are the three that Dr. David is, is looking at. I see that your questions have been coming in, so I'm I'm gonna start um sharing my padlet. So um Dr. David can have a look at it also. Are you able to see um, the padlet with all the I questions? Can. Yes, I okay. can see everything. Yes. Oh, good, good. So, so I think all the audience can see it. So, um, there's also a voting function. So, for the questions which have more votes, um, we will try to address them first because uh, it's really a lot of questions coming in. So, um, maybe let's start with um, we'll leave the cryptocurrency to the to the last. <laughs> They're asking for, for David's and Bowen's opinion on cryptocurrency, but I'll leave that to the last. Let's start with, um, okay, maybe with this one with three votes. Um, Dr. Kaur, as we move into 2021, what kind of market outlook should we expect? So he gives some, like a bidden taking office in January, mutation of COVID, um, China's recovery post-COVID. So I think you covered a, 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 a pretty much some of it um, during your, your, your speech just now. Do you just want to give uh, one or two more pointers on, on this question? Sure, okay. Now, uh, I have a rule of thumb with regards to the stock market, and that is that treasury yields, yields, treasury yields need to be about 3% higher than dividend yields before I would ever consider switching out from the stock market into something safer like bonds. And if you have a look at the moment, um, Dividend yields on average in Singapore is around 3%. So those treasury yields, those 10-year treasury yields, the things we call um, the risk-free investment, would need to be 6% or higher before I would switch out from the stock market into 10-year uh, treasuries. And to be honest with you, Paul, I can't ever see that happening. I can never see treasury yields going up to 6% whilst dividend yields are at 3%. So I think the market outlook is that it will continue to be underpinned by the fact that there is just no pull on stocks coming down. And if you think about it somehow, let's say interest rates at the moment are 1%. we will be generous and call it 1% uh, in the US. It's about sort of 0.8 for treasury yields. But let's call it 1% because it's easy to work with 1%. It means that the P-E ratio of uh, U.S. stocks would need to be 100, 100, before it is actually comparable to 10-year treasuries. What we do is we take the P-E ratio, invert it, multiply it by 100, and then we end up with what we call the earnings yield. And the earnings yield is the ability for companies to, if they wanted to, pay out all of their profits as dividends to shareholders. Now, generally, they don't do that to keep back some of the profits for themselves. But what it really means is that valuations can go up to a PE of 100 
before uh, we would think of them as being relatively expensive. And to just make the point, if interest rates were at zero, it means that the PE ratio would need to be infinity before we would actually say that it is expensive. So I think for quite some time, we don't really have to worry too much about the stock markets, they will do well, but be very selective about what you put your money into. Uh, some industries will do well, some will not do well, and one that I think will struggle for a little while longer, if not for a very long time, uh, would be the airline industry. I think they, they, they will have a problem sort of getting off the ground, uh, if you pardon the pun, in 2021 and beyond. Okay, thanks, thanks, Dr. David, for that. Um, uh, maybe you take another question. Um, pro I understand that tech is not your cup of tea. Um, you drink tea, right, or coffee? <laughs> or no, I don't drink coffee. I only drink tea. I've got okay, one so, to me. Yeah, so probably not your cup of tea, but uh, there's one question regarding uh, the different growth industry like SAAS, 5G, upcoming disruptive industry. Um, he's asking how do we value it? Or maybe, maybe you can just give a general... Um, uh, concept of how do you do valuation on, on, on things that you buy? Yeah. Okay. Well, there are different ways in which you can do it. And as an income investor, I am not interested in the company unless it is, unless it has the ability to pay me a dividend, right? So many of the new uh, software as a service, SAAS companies, don't pay dividends because they're still in the growth phase. So those are the ones that I'm not that interested in. But if you want to have a look at the 5G space and also uh, say the technology companies that have the ability to pay dividends, one of them in the 5G space would be these telecom towers. These are the companies that operate primarily in, Amer primarily in America, but there is also one in China now. And these are the companies that are, believe it or not, REITs. They actually operate telecom tower, towers, and they allow telecom companies to put their satellite dishes on these towers. They generate a, um, a good income of which a large portion is paid to uh, unit holders. And that is the way that I like to play the 5G space. Would I like to go into uh, the companies that make the nuts and bolts for uh, 5G? Would I be interested in companies uh, that operate the service such as say the telecom companies to some extent? but not to the same extent that uh, I like the telecom tower company. So there are two in America that are really worthwhile looking at. And if you have, if you have a look at them and see the rate at which they are able to grow their distributions, I don't think it would take you that long to whip out your checkbook and pen or your uh, wallet and uh, buy shares in either of those two telecom tower companies. And as far as technology companies are concerned, you know, I find that there are two companies that are really well up in the technology space and people don't think of them as being technology companies because they've been around for such a long time. And one of them is MasterCard and the other is Visa. And they are payment processors rather than just companies that send you cards that you put in your wallet. And that is the kind of um, lateral thinking that I tend to use when I'm looking at technology companies. I say, which are the ones that are able to uh, generate a recurring revenue? And those two uh, payment processing companies are ones that I quite like at the moment. Then of course, you've got these mobile phone companies like Apple that are slowly switching away from dependency on uh, handsets into uh, a recurring service. Uh, that they're able to provide for their customers. So I uh, think laterally sometimes, and don't just simply focus on what everybody is buying in terms of software as a service. I'm not saying that Salesforce is a bad company, but it would be a lot better if it paid me a dividend. Okay, so thank you, thank you, David, for, for that. Um, okay, I used to work in the telecom industry for about 12 years, so uh, I know about American towers and stuff like that. So if you guys are interested to know my intakes, inputs on this, then just type, uh, 777 into the chat group. If I see enough, maybe I'll just share one or two companies on 5G. Okay, okay, you guys are interested. That's good. Okay, so maybe let's let share. So remember just now I showed a slide regarding FinTech, Health Tech, and the last one is um, Green Tech. So all of this, I think the enabling technology is 5G. Okay, when I first started in the telecom industry, um, I started off with 3G. That was back in year 2000 in the UK. So 3G took a long time to actually um, materialize. The reason is because 
there wasn't enough demand. Okay, but COVID changes a lot of things. COVID actually accelerates the need of 5G. So if you think about green tech, you start to have EVs, electric vehicles. So these are green tech companies. And fintechs, example, Square and PayPal, okay, they are actually uh, starting to dabble into the Bitcoin exchange. So there's something which is interesting too. But back to 5G, uh, there's two companies which I, I think um, have been around for a long time and will still be around for a very long time. Okay, so one of them is this co company called Corning. Okay, the ticker symbol is GLW and Corning actually does uh, fiber optics. So everybody thinks that 5G, you got very high speed, everything's wireless. But remember, there's always a need for a backhaul. And for the backhaul, you need fiber optics. So I see tremendous growth in this company called Corning. And the other one is actually this company called Qualcomm. Okay, Qualcomm has hold all the patents for the 3G, 4G and 5G um, technologies. Although they are having some uh, intense competition from the Chinese, but still uh, a large part of the world still relies on Qualcomm's patents to, to, to start 5G. So these are the two companies which um, I personally am, am looking at. So um, yeah, so uh, of course, more attention to David. Um, there's another question. I'm not sure whether, David, do you, do you actually invest in ETFs? Um, there's some question on how do we evaluate ETFs actually? Okay, uh, the answer is I do have an ETF and it was uh, one of the first investments I made in my pension fund almost 20 years ago. And uh, I bought an ETF that tracked the FTSE 100. Uh, it's done okay, it hasn't been brilliant, but how do you value ETFs? Ultimately, you're not really supposed to value ETFs because the reason why you buy an ETF is because uh, somebody else out there is going to be doing all the work for you. In other words, an ETF is just an exchange traded fund. And one of the earliest ones, as I said, was the FTSE 100, and it just tracked the FTSE 100 index. The valuation of the ETF is no different to valuing the index itself. So if you were buying an ETF that tracked the Straits Times index, uh, you would look at uh, what the valuation for the STI is going to be and what the dividend yield is going to be. And ultimately, what you do is you just keep on putting money into the ETF and gradually invest uh, any money that you have over time in order to take advantage of the growth of, uh, say, the Straits Times Index, if you're buying an ETF that uh, tracks the STI. Now, of course, you have a lot more exotic products, uh, products that uh, not just track the ETF, oh, sorry, that not just only tracks the index, but they also give you some kind of leverage in some cases. And those are the ones that I'm not really that keen on because I think an ETF should really be a very simple way in which you can participate in the market rather than to try and be smart. I mean, they have these things called inverse ETFs where if the, uh, if the index falls, then your investment goes up in, in, in price, in value. And I think that maybe people are becoming a little bit too uh, smart as far as ETFs are concerned. Um, I'm always reminded whenever I, I see people try and complicate things uh, of a Chinese proverb. In Cantonese, it is called uh, which simply means that you've drawn yourself this beautiful snake and what do you do? You go and add legs to it, right? Why would you want to do something like that? An ETF is just a simple instrument that would allow investors to participate in the market. And uh, if you are interested in ETFs, I would just simply pick either a country ETF or a regional ETF and say, uh, I'm going to be investing in this over the long time. Pound cost average, that investment over a period of time. And I don't think you will go too far wrong if you were to able to do that. And uh, I, I know um, as far as Paul is concerned, your company is inter more interested in things like um, picking stocks. So what I do suggest to people, and this, this is something that I've suggested to my own children when they invested, and that is to start off with the ETF. And as you become a little bit more confident about picking stocks, uh, what you can do is to put the bulk of your money in the ETF, say the Straits Times Index. And if you think that there are certain companies within the uh, STI that you think will uh, perform better, then you can add them to it. So you can do an e uh, STI ETF plus two, add one bank, maybe one telecom. And then if the bank and the telecoms outperforms the, the STI, then your whole investment will outperform the STI. But if those two investments 
don't outperform the STI, you're not going to lose your shirt because the bulk of your money is in the STI. And so therefore, you will just simply track the market. Okay. Yes. Thanks, David. But um, since we're on the topic of, of STI index, um, I think this is posted by one of your followers or fans. Um, he said, has been a follower of a previous Motley Fool Singapore since uh, 2016 and 17. And he mentioned that you spoke that STI is a diverse index having this income source, not just from Singapore, but also from the APEC. And it is a good tool. But um, he commented that, however, these days, people are a bit more bearish on STI. So I think his question to you is, um, has your view changed in any way regarding the STI? Um, any comments on that? Absolutely, absolutely not. You know, <laughs> just because uh, a country's index or rather a stock market index has not performed that well in one year, it doesn't mean that it's not going to perform well over the long term. So don't get too uh, concerned. Don't become too wrapped up in what people say about the STI. Sure, you know, the STI has underperformed the Dow Jones, has underperformed NASDAQ. Uh, I think it might even have underperformed the KLCI, but it doesn't mean that the days of the STI is finished. Remember what the big heavyweights in the STI are. You've got the three banks that uh, are in the STI, and the banks have not done that well this year, but it doesn't mean that the banks won't do well in 2021 and beyond. So therefore, I'm not worried about the STI, and I think when uh, the three banks, DBS, UOB, and OCBC, start to perform well in 2021, then I think it will just simply pull the STI up with it. Okay, thanks, David, for that. Yeah, so um, like, like David has mentioned, uh, his view is in the long term, like five, ten years and, and longer. So um, it's not like a short term or, or, or uh, investor, so it doesn't bother him. Yeah, so, so, so this, this, you must know what sort of investor you are and then go for the, the instrument that, that you use. So ETFs, personally, I also own some ETFs, but that are for my more stable parts. For those, I do stock selections, but ETF can form... Uh, or sometimes when, example, when I'm unsure, example, recently I bought into this ARK Invest um, tax, tax ETF, okay, ARKK, okay. Um, the thing is because it's so advanced in the research and the things that they're doing that I do not want to pick any single company from it and I just write the trend with the ETF. So that's sometimes how you can use an ETF. And uh, one example was um, many years ago, uh, back in 2004 or 2003, um, I bought an ETF of China, um, China index, okay? I think that time it was at below 1,002 or 1,003. I write it all the way to 3,000 in one and a half years, okay? But that was because I simply look at the ETF at a time and the PE is below, I think it's seven or eight at a time. So to me, it's China, a growing company, having a PE of eight is a no-brainer. I just put my money there. So, so there are ways that you can use ETFs um, uh, if, uh, uh, as a defensive or more, should I say, um, a uh, sure, sure, uh, a sure way, a safer way to to to, to do things. So, so that's that's my my personal view. The, uh, David, I've been trying to hold off the cryptocurrency, but there are like plenty of of um, uh, votes on it and stuff. So, um, let's start with this question. Um, um, would like to have hear from both David and Bo. And Bo is one of our co-founder on their views on cryptos in general, whether they are uh, that whether you'll be buying. So, so David, maybe you should start off. Uh, no, I told you what, I'll let Bowen go first. Yeah. He okay, can, okay. Yeah, he, he can go first and then um, I'll, I'll be glad to hear what he has to say about cryptocurrency. Okay, okay Bowen, can you share okay. your views on that? All right, all right, sure. Yeah, so of course, thanks, David, for actually sharing with us. I actually took down a lot of notes, so thanks for sharing. Yeah, so when it comes to cryptocurrency, I think the first thing I just want to say is that currently for myself, I am not invested in any cryptocurrencies, <laughs> you know, but having said that, Okay, I think for me, when I look at a stock market and when I look at cryptocurrencies, I love to look at it from a fundamental point of view first. You know, like what David mentioned, is the company generating profits? Because if if you're investing in something that is not generating real real profits or real gains, you know, as an investor, what we are betting on is basically just the market sentiment or simply just, you know, the hype on how popular this currency is. Right. So from a fundamental point of view, I still see that right now cryptocurrencies are a little bit vague. Uh, although, yes, you have governments uh, putting money in, you have big companies putting money in, 
But at the same time, to me, I still see that these companies they are just diversifying. They are they are just putting a small part of their money in there in the event whereby it works out, they will be able to benefit from it. But for me, when I look at Bitcoin on its own, I actually look at the trend itself. So, for example, in uh, December 13, the market actually break above 20,000. So, from a technical perspective, you know, I would enter at 20,000 when it actually break a new high because I know that it will continue to go higher from all the push, from all the demand, you know. So, I'll probably look at it from a technical point of view and I'll only put a small percentage of my uh, money into it. Okay, a follow-on question since you're there is actually for Ultimate Investing, but conveniently, I'll pass it to you. Um, can you advise and recommend ways to invest in Bitcoin using options? Um, I think you have tried to look at it in a certain way besides buying Bitcoin direct. So you want to share some of your experience or, or ex um, um, research that you have done into this, this area using options to buy Bitcoin or futures? Yeah, at the current moment, I think when it comes to Bitcoin, you can invest with futures but for me personally, I am not definitely going into futures for Bitcoin because you have to understand that futures, when you make money, you can make a lot of money. And when the thing goes south, your loss is infinite, right? So that is something that I am definitely not familiar with and I'm definitely not touching it. Lah. So if you are looking for Bitcoin, I will still recommend you to go and really, really physically go and get the uh, Bitcoin through like Binance or some of the other uh, platform. Okay, okay. It's funny, you know, I see, I'm, I'm also seeing chats from our insiders Telegram chat and they are saying that, hey, why nobody is asking Ivan about his, his view? Because he's the only co-founder that actually own Bitcoin and I think he made quite a lot of money. So Ivan, maybe you can just share a few points on, on Bitcoin from your perspective. Besides, you fought a lot. Lah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so sorry, David, I'm holding up your, your views on Bitcoin. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. Um, recently, Warren Buffett says that uh, Bitcoin is uh, kind of like red poison. Yeah, poison red. Um, yeah. So, but to me, uh, Bitcoin is a very different um, instrument altogether. It's about managing your risk. So, um, I know it's very risky. It's super high risk. There is no, there is no specific uh, uh, fundamentals for you to study at all. It's mainly through trend and and everyone's um, kind of like just a uh, formal jumping into it. But the thing is, uh, for me, um, when I buy into Bitcoins, I'm actually looking a lot at what, like David has mentioned earlier on, talk about the currency, the US dollar has been dropping. So I'm looking at something that's beyond, many years beyond now. So um, I'm actually into Bitcoins a um, couple of years ago. It's from, I think, 2016 onwards or even earlier. I can't remember. And then what happened is that um, recently I also noticed uh, because for ultimate investing, we use a lot of, uh, we used to use charts to look at like what Bon has mentioned. So it, in May and June, when the time the Bitcoin was pretty low, I actually have an entry signal and uh, some of my uh, fellow students actually jump in together. So, well, pretty good money. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, for me, Bitcoin is something that is in the, for the future. Um, of course, it's high risk, so only buy what you can afford to lose entirely. Yeah, what you can afford to lose entirely. So if you don't have, a, if you can't even sleep with a thousand dollars exposed in Bitcoin, don't do it. Yeah. All right. Okay. So hmm, that's why. Yeah, I, thanks, yeah. thanks, Ivan, for your insights. But I'm sure this year has been very profitable for Ivan. Yeah. So anyway, so back to David. So um, your your views on Bitcoin. Okay, uh, I tell you what, Paul, uh, can everybody see my screen, this thing? <laughs> okay, right. This is the next race at um, Cranji, yeah? I quite, <laughs> like the, I, I, I quite like the looks of Boom Shakalaka in the next race at Cranji, okay? And that is about my, uh, uh, my take on uh, cryptocurrencies. Don't confuse, don't ever confuse cryptocurrencies with blockchains. Blockchains are going to change the way that the world is going to operate. But as far as cryptocurrencies are concerned, yeah, it is going to be a gamble. And what I say to people who are interested in cryptocurrencies is very similar to what um, your co-founders have also said. And I'm sure you share the sentiment as well. And that is that build yourself a solid portfolio, right? And in my case, it is 60% worth of strong income generating shares. 
Then you have 40% of what we would call growth shares. These are the fast growing companies. They don't pay a lot of dividends, but the dividends can grow very quickly over time. So 60 plus 30 leaves you 10% at the, at the top, yeah, 100%. So it leaves you with 10%. And of that, of that 10% of your portfolio, some of it can go into um, value shares or uh, more speculative investments in the stock market, but it can also be your cryptocurrencies. So don't put all your money into cryptocurrencies, except the fact that cryptocurrencies are gonna be very volatile, but if only a small percentage of your portfolio is in cryptocurrencies, say less than 5%, more like 2%. If you lose it, well, it's not gonna change your life, but if it works out well and you make money on it, fantastic. And that is the same attitude that you should take with any kind of uh, investment that is outside of the four asset classes. And the four asset classes are uh, cash, bonds, properties, and stock. Out of, out of those four, you still have a lot of exotic investments. And if you have got some spare cash, then put it into those exotic, exotic investments. But don't weigh your portfolio down with any of those exotic investments that will prevent you from having a good uh, restful sleep at night. You do not want sleepless nights worrying about, you know, if 90% of your wealth was actually in cryptocurrencies. You hear about all these wealthy people, People like Bill Gates, who has a bit of money in cryptocurrencies, that's fine. But you're not going to see him put all of his money into cryptocurrencies. And I think that is really uh, the, the, the same kind of advice that we should take for our own portfolios. Don't lose your money on cryptocurrencies. I think there were, the, Warren Buffett once came up with uh, a saying, which was, there are two rules in investing. Number one, uh, don't lose your money. And number two, don't forget rule one, yeah? And I think that is the same with cryptocurrencies. Um, by all means, have a little bit of fun with it. And it is really no different to going down to Kranji and betting on boom shakalaka laka at the next one. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks, David, for that. Actually, very interesting. Um, I've got a friend uh, who is, uh, used to be a, um, a JP Morgan um, banker and he retired in Singapore. So now he starts learning this programming um, language called Python. And he's trying to write an algorithm to, to predict uh, horse racing, who will win. And he says, it's pretty good. It's like 60%. So I'll link you up later with him <laughs> and you can have a chat. Yes. Um, we wish that we can carry on this conversation for a long time, I guess. Are you guys enjoying it? If you are enjoying it, can you just type in a yes into the chat group? I think I'll see a lot of yes, yes, we are loving it. But unfortunately, we have only about two, three minutes left for this section. So I think one last question, which I think um, is quite, quite, quite interesting is um, this person is quite greedy. Um, the title of it is called Hidden Jam and it's asking what is your top three highest conviction stock that are not currently covered by mainstream media? Wow, I have to say this guy is very greedy because usually these are secrets. Secrets, usually if you show one, that's a lot already, but um, I don't know, any of the co-founders want to share one of, one of your top conviction stocks that are not covered by mainstream or David, have you got something like that? I'll, I'll let your co-founders go first. Yeah? <laughs> Anybody? Nobody? Okay, no, let, let me go first. Oh, okay, let me go first, Ivan. Okay. Um, recently, I was I was talking to 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 our our community and stuff like that. I say, you know, they say travel stocks. Travel stock is gonna come back again. I say, why why travel stocks? Oh, airlines gonna fly again. Say yes, but when? So to me, I was looking at this um company. Uh, it's called Windabago. It's actually uh, introduced to me by Ivan. Okay, Windabago is a company that actually does uh, caravans. Okay, and only in Singapore and, uh, sorry, only in US and Australia and maybe Canada, they're pretty big. Because in Singapore, we don't have a garage, we can't park a caravan. Okay, so, so I think this company has been performing extremely well, okay, during COVID and has been going up. Because when you can't travel like what you used to do, you start to think of alternative ways to travel. One of the ways I go on a road trip with my close friends. You know, in Singapore, if you limit to five person or eight person, you still can do it on a caravan. So they see an uptick in terms of sales and stuff like that. So that is definitely not a stock in the mainstream. Uh, I wouldn't say I have a top condition in it, but I think I'll put some money in it just to um, ride the wave for, for me. So that's that's Windabago. The ticker symbol is WGO. Okay, that's that's my take. Ivan Bowen, any 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 things from you guys? Um yeah, for me, um, and I have one really off the mainstream, uh, especially during COVID time, since no one's traveling, everyone's staying at home. 
So since everyone's staying home, people start looking into things that to improve in their house. So one of the thing it's super duper important for everyone is sleep, right? So I happen to found this company that is uh, actually uh, deals with mattresses. It's called Sleep Number. So it's uh, listed in the US. Sleep Number is a very good mattress, I think. I hope I've never tried it before, but then uh, I checked the fundamentals. They're pretty good numbers. And generally, they're making quite a fair bit, especially during this COVID time. So everyone uh, staying at home, change their mattresses, buy new beds, maybe making more babies. I don't know. But then, <laughs> yeah, anyway, so this is something that you guys can uh, maybe take a look at it. Yeah, so sleep number. Okay. Bowen, anything from you, Bowen? All right. So for me, probably I have a slightly different view. So for me, very simple, I like to look at trend. So whatever is mainstream, you have to understand that if you want the stock price to go up fast, all right, it has to be something that is mainstream because everybody is looking at it. Everybody is investing in it, right? So for me, when I look at trend, most of the companies that uh, I would actually go into are relatively new uh, companies that has gotten the attention of the public and everybody is talking about, about it, right? But I have two companies that I find that they are actually super, super good. They are actually relatively popular company, but probably for right now, they are not the mainstream. One of them is a bot lab. Okay, so if you have babies, uh, they are the largest milk powder and of course all the labs, uh, they are really huge. Lah. And the other one is actually 3M, right? These are companies that are really huge, giving dividends and growing dividends, but yet I would say that they are not on the mainstream right now but i still see that they actually are giving good value at the current moment so a bot lab as well as 3m very interesting uh, recently i was doing some uh, car detailing for my car and then i turned back and look at the, the 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 stickers and stuff and it says 3m but i bought it from taobao from china so i don't know whether this is the real 3m or the taobao version of 3m but anyway <laughs> david um your your views any one maybe just one one stock Okay, okay. I'll, I'll give you more than one stock. I'll give, you okay, an, I'll give you an entire sector, right? All right. And, okay. And one that people aren't really talking about much at the moment are insurance companies. Uh, but I think in uh, 2021 and beyond, people will be re-evaluating their uh, association with uh, insurers. People will think that they are being underinsured at the moment and they need to actually buy more insurance. Many of, of the insurance companies haven't been able to, during 2020, uh, reconnect with uh, their customers simply because of the social dis distancing that's going on. So it's been quite difficult for them to sell insurance. But um, I have to say in 2020, I have been piling into insurance companies. And some of my favorite names in Hong Kong, uh, AIA Insurance, Ping An Insurance, uh, Prudential, which is also listed in Hong Kong, over in Malaysia, you've got um, Allianz Malaysia, you've got uh, Takaful, which is a Sharia compliant insurance company. And the reason why I think insurance companies will do well is because number one, people will be more concerned about their health and uh, the ability to provide for their dependents if they were to ever fall ill. And the second one is because a big bulk of the insurance company's money, their float, is invested in the stock market. So if the stock market is going to do well, then many of these insurance companies will be able to grow uh, their funds. So uh, insurance companies are the ones that I have been very interested in alongside the banks in 2020. Okay. Thanks a lot, David. Thank, thank you so much for your insights. I'm sure all of you have enjoyed uh, what David has shared and uh, can't, can't wait to get more, but unfortunately, our time is up. So um, David's going to leave us um, or he can hang around after this when we move on to the next segment. But uh, can we just have uh, show your appreciation uh, to David, either a clap, uh, a thank you, David, in the, in the group chat. I'm sure you have uh, learned a lot from him today. Yes. Thank okay, you. good. So th thank you so much, David, for, for being our special invited guest today. Uh, you're free to, to hang on and listen to the rest of the events and you're free to, to go to. So um, I'll, I'll leave it to you. But uh, really, thank you so much. And thank uh, yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, I'm going to pass it back to Regina. Regarding what has been shared so far by Bowen, please post it on the Zoom chat group.